Well, you're most welcome to this talk, and it's nearly Thursday, the 26th of May. Now, I want to look at a, an article from the CDC about long COVID at the moment. And here's the uh, sort of credit card that the, the CDC like to put out. Approximately one in five adults aged over 18 have a health condition that might be related to their previous COVID-19 illness. And here it looks at various possible conditions, neurological, kidney, musculoskeletal, cardiovascular, respiratory and blood clots and vascular disorders. Now, this is saying here that, that uh, one in five people who've actually had the infection could have these uh, one, one or more of these conditions. Now, I must say this seems remarkably high and um, I don't really see why the CDC would want to artificially overinflate these figures. So um, we have to assume it's their honest interpretation. But if we can compare it with the UK figures, latest UK figures is 2.8% is of the population. OK, this is the whole population, but it's, it's a heck of a difference from, say, 18% or 20% from the States. 2.8 in the UK, way, way lower. And this is self-reported uh, covid and a lot of people believe that this figure is, is higher than we would think because some people who think they have long COVID actually don't have long COVID. So one heck of a discrepancy there really in the figures between the uh, United States and the United Kingdom. Uh, in the United Kingdom, of that 2.8%, that 73% of that 2.8%, symptoms at least 12 weeks and 44%, of that 2.8% for at least a year. So this is not minimising the problem. And of course, on this channel, we've talked to people who've been completely debilitated with long COVID. Very wide spectrum of severity. But uh, these figures in the United States are indicating that it's it's a much higher prevalence in the state. So quite as what is going on here now, this is from this paper here, just published on the uh, 24th of May, just a day or two ago. Uh, on this very uh, topic and here's the here's the credit card there that we've just had a had a look at so let's try and unpack this a bit and the first thing a lot of you are going to say I know this from the comments um, do they take account of whether people are vaccinated or not and the answer is no they don't they take no account of vaccination. So what they do is they take a group of people suffering symptoms who have had COVID, diagnosed COVID, against those who have not been diagnosed with COVID, and, and they can compare the two. They have not considered vaccination status at all, at all in this study, which is, which is a really quite a glaring omission. Now, we couldn't really say that vaccination was higher or lower in one group or the other, where the vaccination was higher in the COVID group or in the control group, the non-COVID group. We simply can't tell that. I mean, we could make some assumptions that there, there was more uh, COVID-19 in the unvaccinated group, but, but we simply don't know that. We're simply not told. They took that into no consideration whatsoever. So does that pretty well dismiss this study uh, before we start? Some might, some might sort of lean towards that direction. Nevertheless, there's some interesting things in it. Let's, let's go on and look at that now. Um, now, so that's the study there from the States. People previously infected with SARS coronavirus 2 um, reported persist people that reported persistent symptoms. And they classified persistent symptoms as symptoms which were present for uh, greater than four weeks or equal to four weeks. So equal to or greater than four weeks after acute COVID-19. Now, this is a fairly pessimistic condition in, in, in assumption. In, in any viral condition, it's quite common not to feel quite right for, for a week or two or three or four so to classify four weeks as long COVID seems rather short to me. Remember in the United Kingdom, we had these definitions here that we were using. Um, basically for 12 weeks, 73% uh, of the 2.8 had symptoms for 12 weeks, 44% uh, for at least one year. And 12 weeks is kind of more the normal to take uh, long COVID as a definition as. But in the United States, it's almost as if they're trying to get the numbers as high as possible. Uh, four weeks. Now, March the 
March 2020 to November 2021. United States uh, people uh, equal to or over the age of 18. And they looked at the incidence of 26 conditions that are often or previously associated to post-COVID-19. Now, some parts of the paper, they say, often associated, other parts they see previously attributed. And we will be looking at these later on. If you want to stick around till the end, we'll go through them in a little more detail. But among all patients aged 18 or more, 38% of uh, case patients experienced uh, an incident condition. That's one of the conditions. 38% of people. Now, the case patients, of course, are those that actually were diagnosed with COVID. Now, you don't need me to tell you that the uh, the, the, the credit card that we looked at before said uh, one in five, which is 20%. And and this is saying 38%. Now, what they actually say, to get from one to the other, they say these figures translate into. So they say that these figures here translate into the one in five figure and now if you don't fully understand that uh, join the club but this is exactly what the paper says it's not well written really at all um anyway this is the data they give 38 percent of um case patients 16 percent of control patients had one or more uh, symptom that's a uh, or the whole group over over um, 18. Now, what they did was they divided this into two groups. They divided it into the 18 to 64 year old group and the over 64 year old age group, which is quite good because you get you get more data from the same from the same amount of uh, information collected if you break it down into age groups. So, 18 to 64, it was uh, 35.4 reported uh, an, an incident condition, at least one. 14.6% of controls. And again, this is good because you have you have a group. You can compare one with the other. Um, it gives you a comparison, which is, which is good. It's retrospective, but it is a retrospective cohort group. Now, in the over 65s, um, it was uh, more. It was uh, 45.4% of case patients uh, complained of a condition and 18.5% of controls. And that, and, and what this says, these figures translate into, and quite how they translate into this, we don't really know. But this, this is what they say: one in five in the eighteen to sixty-four year old old age group, but a higher uh, one in four in the over sixty-five year old age group. This is what they translate into. Now that they are probably quite correct in this because they have a whole status statisticians unit at the cdc so they've probably done something very clever it's just that they haven't explained it very well but we just have to take the data that we are we are given um experience an innocent condition that might be might be attributable to covid19 so again you know kind of a bit speculative here conditions uh conditions uh, affected multiple systems so they could affect the cardiovascular system the breathing system the pulmonary system uh, the blood system, the kidney system, the gland system, the uh, gut system, the muscles and the bones, the nervous system, or the mind, psychiatric signs and symptoms. So a wide range of conditions have been reported. And as I say, we will, um, if you want to stick around, we will be looking at these in a little more detail for those of us that take an interest in the specific conditions. Now, the highest risk ratio Highest risk ratio was acute pulmonary embolism. In the 18 to 64 year old age group, that they were 2.1 times more likely to have an acute pulmonary embolism. Acute means it's just happened. Pulmonary means it's to do with the lungs. Embolism means it's a blood clot which has moved there. Now, what actually happens is we can do a quick sketch. If if we've got the uh, the, the blood vessels here in in the legs, and they go back into the blood vessels in the abdomen. And these go back into the heart here. So these blood vessels will go back into the into the top side of the heart, actually. And then these will be uh, th- th- these will actually be pumped out to the lungs. So the blood will be pumped out to the lungs from from the heart. Uh, vessel going to each side of the, the each lung, and these will divide into smaller and smaller branches. This is the way this this works. So if there's a blood clot uh, here in the deep veins of the leg, typically. Uh, that will come up here through the uh, 
through the femoral vein, through the inferior vena cava, into the right atrium of the heart, um, through to the right ventricle, and the right ventricle pumps blood out into the lungs. And uh, if the blood clot goes through here, it'll fit through there a bit. Then as it goes through there, it'll get to a smaller vessel and eventually it'll get, it'll get stuck and jammed in there. So that, that starts off as, a, off as a deep venous thrombosis there. And once it moves, it's called an embolism. And once it lodges in the lungs, it becomes a pulmonary embolism. So that's what's happening. But this is bad because, of course, this cuts off the blood supply to an area of lung. Which is exactly what we uh, what we don't want. There's a pulmonary embolism, and that, and large ones, of course, are fatal. Uh, anyway, um, getting back to the point, two uh, two point one times more likely to get it in that age group. In the over 65s, two point two times, not percentage, two point two times more likely to get it. So a significant increase in risk. But as we said, this does not account for vaccination status. That's just the information that we have. Um, does this mean that COVID increases the, uh, having had COVID increases the risk of pulmonary embolism? Yes, I do believe that that, that risk is there. Uh, does it tell us the relative risk for vaccine or the relative risk overall in, in quantitative terms? Perhaps le less so than this would imply. Um, but there is an increased risk. A lot of studies show that. Respiratory signs and symptoms uh, again, 2.1 2 increased uh, times risk in both age groups. Of course, that's a rather vague term. Now, the CDC then say cr critical to reducing the incidence and impact of post-COVID. So what the heck do we do about this? Well, they say, first of all, implementation of COVID-19 preventative strategies. Well, I'm not quite sure how you prevent COVID-19 because it's, end it's now endemic. So I'm not quite sure how they propose to do that. They don't say. Uh, routine assessment for post-COVID conditions. We agree with that because the con most conditions, we can treat them better if we detect them early. And they say these things are, are critical if, in reducing the incidence and impact of COVID-19. But I'm not quite sure how we prevent it because we decided, oh, I don't know, probably over a year ago on this channel that we can't prevent it. It's going to be, it's, it's going to be everywhere. Everyone's going to be exposed to it. We really can't prevent it. So other than optimizing the health of the immune system, I'm not really quite sure what they mean, but they don't say. Right, the research study is retrospective. So it's looking back and it's a matched cohort design, a cohort who'd had the disease and a cohort who hadn't. It's from March, 2020 to November, 2021. Um, so it's not including the new variants. But they actually looked at uh, 63 million health records, 110 data contrib contrib contributors, 50 states. Uh, case patients, patients who had actually had COVID, uh, 353,000. Control patients, uh, to compare those two, over a million. So pretty good groups. And of course, they were fully accounted for the difference in the numbers between those two groups. Um, case patients or control patients with a previous history of one of the conditions, of course, in the past year uh, were excluded. Now, I would have preferred that the exclusion period was longer because if someone's had a condition two, three years ago, they're more likely to get a condition now. So one year wasn't really long enough, but that's, that's what they did. They excluded them if they'd had a condition in that previous year. Now they found no significant difference uh, between cerebrovascular disease, mental health conditions and substance related disorders between those who had had COVID and those who had not had COVID. There weren't significant, statistically significant difference. But they did notice difference by age groups were noted. So uh, cardiac dysrhythmias where there's an abnormal heart rhythm 18 to 64s, their chances were 1.7 times the control group, whereas the uh, older age group were only 1.5 times more likely than the control group to develop a cardiac dysrhythmia. Now, a dysrhythmia means there's an abnormality in the heart rhythm. So a normal heart rhythm has got a, a P, a QRS, a P, P, Q, 
R, S, and uh, a T wave in the right order and it's regular and the rate is supposed to be between uh, 60 and 100. But if this becomes irregular, for example in atrial fibrillation, that would be a dysrhythmia, that there's an abnormality of the heart rhythm. That's what that means. And these can be quite serious. Of course, um, an abnormality for the heart rhythm could, could be a life-threatening condition. So ventricular fibrillation, for example, is, is an immediate cardiac arrest situation. Well, you could get a condition where you just get the occasional ectopic beat. There's, a, there's an irregular beat occasionally from time to time. They would all be included in cardiac dysrhythmias, and they didn't break it down, unfortunately. So that's all the information we've got. But they were more common... Um, in the younger age group relative risk of 1.7 compared to the control group so if this is correct it's saying that people who have had COVID are quite a lot more likely to develop um, abnormal heart rates which which is is concerning no, no one's minimizing the uh the, 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 the potential sequelae of, of COVID here. It's just that we can't differentiate various factors. This is the difficulty. Anyway, um, musculoskeletal pain, again, relative risk 1.6 in uh, younger people, 1.6 times more likely to get it. Um, older people down to 1.4. But the relative risk for 10 conditions were significantly higher amongst those aged over 65. So those two were really the exceptions, the dysrhythmias and the uh, musculoskeletal. All the other conditions were more common in the older people. So renal failure, where the kidneys stop producing adequate urine. Thromboembolic disease, where there's blood clots in the vessels. Cerebrovascular disease, where there's a disruption to the blood supply in the brain. Type 2 diabetes, where there's a dysregulation and an inability to lower blood glucose levels. Uh, muscle disorders. Neurological disorders of the nervous system, mental health conditions, including mood disorders, that's like depression mostly, anxiety, substance-related disorders. Um, all more common in the elderly, although we saw that substance abuse disorders were not statistically more common in the COVID group compared to the non-COVID group. It doesn't say what substances were being abused. One would have assume in the older group it's mostly alcohol but it doesn't say so limitations in this study patients infected with recent variants really won't be taken into account because this is pre-omicron acute COVID-19 infection might be biased towards a population that is seeking care so this was taken from patients that had sought care so that's going to skew figures and of course the big one is that the vaccination status was not uh, considered that really is um, the big, biggish, b bigger, biggest problem with this study that that was not considered. So there we go. That's the uh, that's the headline screen there. Now I, I did promise to show you the conditions they were talking about. So let's just look at some of those now. These are the was it the twenty six conditions. Um, let me just find those and we'll have a quick browse through them. These are conditions that have been found to be more common in patients that have had uh, COVID-19 to patients that haven't. So um, cardiovascular disease, cardiac dysrhythmias, as we've mentioned. Heart failure is where the heart can't pump out enough blood to meet the metabolic demands of the body. Acute myocardial infarction is a disruption to the blood supply of the heart muscle. Myocarditis is the uh, inflammation, typically, well, itis is inflammation of the myocardium. And cardiomyopathy uh, is disease of the, of, of the heart muscle. So um, myocarditis would be inflammation of the heart muscle. Cardiomyopathy would be disease of the heart muscle. Acute pulmonary embolism, asthma, um, respiratory symptoms uh, renal failure and chronic uh, kidney disease so typically that would mean an acute renal failure what we now call an acute kidney injury and that's a, a ckd a chronic kidney disease and again remember these are all conditions that have been suggested as being more common in people that have had covid con compared to people that have not had covid and that's what this study was looking for 
Coagulation is clotting, hemorrhagic is bleeding events and thromboembolic events, as well as a thrombus, followed by an embolism, which is the thrombus on the move. Cerebrovascular disease is disease of the blood supply of the brain. Gastrointestinal is the uh, gut all the way through from the stomach to the uh, rectum, to the anus. And uh, esophageal, the, well, I would include esophageal as part of the GI tract, but they're making them separate. Uh, neurological smell and taste disturbance, neurological conditions, again not specified. Sleeping disorders, other mental health conditions, substance related disorders, anxiety, mood disorders like depression. Uh, malaise, malaise just means you don't feel well, fatigue, musculoskeletal pain and uh, finally diabetes all have been considered uh, in various studies to be more common in people that have had COVID-19 and can be part of long COVID symptoms. So there we go, that is that study. Um, it's certainly uh, interesting. Um, I believe it to be to give to give a, a pessimistic to give a pessimistic uh, hue to the whole uh, to the whole problem. Not to minimise the people that are suffering from long COVID. We, we know that is certainly the case, uh, but but not to include vaccination status in is perhaps the the, the major omission of this study. But I'll just leave you with that uh, that screen there. It's relatively common according to this data um, but strange that it's about uh, nine times more common in the states than in the united kingdom that's the data we have you interpret it as best you can i've put all the links in there do take a look at it and thank you for watching